The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Karen Brosnahan, Managing Director of HR Services. On behalf of Jim McSweeney and all of us here at the CIP Group, welcome. Today's webinar topic is about the employer medical assistance contribution, the dreaded EMAC. These changes will be going into effect on January 1st. And we'll also be having an update on latest developments in um, the legislation affecting group health plans. We're very happy to have Rick Seaback from Parker, Brown, McCauley, and Sheeran as our presenter again today. Rick is a renowned expert in employee benefits and on compliance with our state and federal healthcare reform. Just some quick notes before we begin. A PDF of today's PowerPoint presentation has been attached as a handout and can be printed for your information and use. The second is that we are recording the webinar today and it will be available on the Ask CIP website. Third, if you have questions during the webinar, please enter them in the question pane located on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can in the time allowed. So with that, thank you again for joining us today. The presentation will now begin. Th uh, thank you, Karen, and uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank the CIP group and in particular uh, Karen Brosnahan and Jim McQueenie for asking me to uh, uh, present uh, on this important issue uh, uh, and to be a, in general a presenter uh, for your monthly program uh, uh, once again. So um, without further ado, um, uh, we're here to talk namely about the EMAC or the Employer Medical Assistance Contribution. Uh, we're very lucky uh, that uh, uh, the regs were just issued, or they were draft regs, but they were issued on Monday. So today's uh, program is, uh, is very, very timely. Uh, we are also going to talk about some ACA uh, developments. Uh, it just, I always say it, 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 it's always around. The ACA always seems to, uh, it doesn't go away. And I jokingly say that the two most likely things to survive a nuclear blast would be uh, cockroaches and, and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it just um, um, continues no matter what certainly has at least nine lives, if not more. So I'm going to start, you might say, why are we going to start here? This is really the scorecard of what's happened in 2017 with regard to repeal, replace, delay, reform, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, what all of these have in common, um, all of these provisions, all of these laws or, or bills was that they all had some kind of Medicaid reform. And the EMAC that we're talking about today is really um, uh, relates to Medicaid. Here in, in Massachusetts, obviously, our Medicaid program uh, and children's health insurance program and whatnot together uh, is known as MassHealth. Uh, so in all of these, there was some kind of uh, uh, Medicaid reform. Uh, because none of these have passed, uh, uh, there is no Medicaid reform, at least from the federal side. Uh, probably the largest reform of Medicaid would have been the Graham-Cassidy bill in the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is the uh, bill that provided block grants where they were going to take the federal money that was spent on uh, premium tax credits for those in, a, in an exchange and the cost-sharing reduction money for people in the exchanges, and also the um, Medicaid expansion money, and take that money and, and block grant it to the states and let the states do their own thing. Uh, uh, but as I said, uh, we are just treading water at this point. So as a result of what didn't happen on the prior slide, the Affordable Care Act is still the law of the land. Uh, and as you've probably heard and read, the exchanges or marketplaces, as they're now called, are very tenuous, not necessarily in the Northeast, but in many places across the country. Uh, there are 
county after county after county uh, that have um, but one uh, choice uh, in the exchange uh, for individual uh, market coverage. The IRS continues to struggle with the mandate enforcement technology. However, I will tell you that just last week, the IRS updated a very long Q&A that they have on uh, the Affordable Care Act in general. And they've gone ahead and added information about how they intend to collect the employer mandate penalties. Uh, so that's something that's relatively new that happened within, uh, within the last week. So although they've struggled, no one's been assessed anything, even from the 2015 reporting year, um, it does seem to be on the horizon. But the point of, of all of this today is that Medicaid expansion has really become a growing problem for the feds and for all of the states, uh, and uh, including Massachusetts. Now, Medicaid you know, was created 45 years ago, and it was really supposed to be um, uh, medical welfare and a safety net for uh, women and children and the disabled. When the Affordable Care Act came along in 2010, it expanded uh, the basic uh, Medicaid format. Uh, which was already kind of underwater, uh, and it expanded it to individuals that were childless, were not elderly, uh, and uh, had incomes that were uh, in less than 133% of the federal poverty line. As a result of the expansion under the Affordable Care Act, which, by the way, the federal government has, has taken on much of the cost of the expansion, uh, at least presently. Medicaid now insures more than 72 million people nationwide. That's one in every five Americans are, is, is on Medicaid. Uh, as you may have heard, under the Affordable Care Act, a number of people became covered under the, um, uh, became covered under the Affordable Care Act. Many of them, a majority of them were as a result of the Medicaid expansion. Uh, there are some states where it's higher. Uh, participation in the Medicaid program is more than one in every five. And guess what? We're sitting in one of those states in Massachusetts. Medicaid as, as a federal program is now the third largest program in the federal budget and the fastest growing. Again, here in Massachusetts, uh, MassHealth provides coverage to almost 2 million low-income residents. That's about one in four. Uh, Governor Baker feels that maybe by the end of this fiscal year, we could be looking at almost one in three residents will have MassHealth coverage. MassHealth is the state's largest budgetary expense, 40% of the budget. Okay, the budget that was just uh, passed in well, it was passed in July, signed by the, 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 the governor uh, uh, late July. Uh, the budget for the state for the year was 39 point, I think it was $7 billion. And 14.7 billion of that was the Medicaid tab. Uh, the problem is, is that the governor and other mass officials feel that there's at least 300,000 people working full time in Massachusetts that are enrolled in Mass Health, which is costing Massachusetts about a billion dollars a year, uh, rather than being on their employer sponsored plan. So pardon, um, pardon the lead in, uh, but this is where we are. All right. Uh, we have, we've now, the result is we now have a new Massachusetts employer assessment, which takes place in, in 2018. Uh, uh, and those 300,000 people, um, it should be noted that under mass health reform, if you had a job and you had employer sponsored coverage, even if you, you met the income qualification for mass health, you couldn't be in mass health under mass health reform. But when the Medicaid expansion took place as part of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, we adopted the Affordable Care Act rules which permitted people who had employer-sponsored coverage available to them to still 
choose Medicaid if that was a better deal for them. Um, and so that's what you see in that, that fourth bullet here in, um, in Massachusetts. So now we get to talk about the, uh, uh, the mighty EMAC and what's also now being called the EMAC supplement. Okay, so the current EMAC is something that is probably not unfamiliar to you. It's a payroll tax. It's really paid by, by just about all employers. And its sole purpose is to help finance the cost of subsidizing care for low-income residents. Now, the EMAC hasn't been around very long. Uh, it's only been around since four years ago. It became effective January 1, 2014. And it was enacted as part of the repeal of Massachusetts' fair share co contribution. Remember that puppy? Um, um, which was the <laughs> bane of our existence for, for a long time. Also repealed was the medical security program. The medical security program was, was part of unemployment insurance. And if you were on unemployment and you didn't have any other coverage available to you, okay, um, you could uh, get some level of medical coverage from the Division of Unemployment Assistance. And so um, uh, what the governor uh, uh, did at that time, Governor Deval Patrick, uh, said, well, the medical security program is going away. There is a payroll tax associated that, with that, however small. Um, so why don't we create the EMAC? And um, since people are already paying a payroll tax for the medical security program, which is now going away, and not that no one would be the wiser, but you're already paying a payroll tax. Why don't we bump it a little bit and we'll call it an EMAC and we'll use it to finance the cost of, of low income uh, medical care. Uh, the EMAC uh, is paid again by employers on the first $15,000 of each employee's wages. And those wages are, are uh, uh, multiplied by an assigned rate and those amounts are paid to the Division of Unemployment Assistance, although it is kept in a separate uh, account or trust. The funds are not commingled with the unemployment insurance funds. Now, the EMAC only applies to employers that have an average of six or more employees in a quarter. Uh, and if you're a, a small and growing employee, employer, um, and you hit six for the first time, your, ex, your liability under the EMAC is phased in over a number of years. And actually for the first three years, uh, uh, you don't have any uh, financial liability as far as the EMAC goes in terms of, of a rate. So this existed um, already uh, uh, as we rolled into, um, as we rolled into 2017. Now, what happened in January of this year is Governor Baker had his, had his budget proposal, as he's required to do, um, and it included an employer contribution assessment. And this was meant to offset the mass health funding shortfall, which is approaching $600 million. Uh, and so the governor says, hey, we've got these rapidly increasing health care costs. In mass health, we've got to do something about it. The governor also felt that a lot of the rise in these costs were a result of, get ready for this, employers in the private sector cost shifting to the Mass Health program. Now, I admittedly some of that might go on, but most of the problem here was caused by the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion. Uh, but not for the Medicaid expansion, there wouldn't be as much cost shifting uh, because, because again, if you have an employer-sponsored plan, you have a low-wage worker, they're looking at your plan, they're looking at mass health, which includes dental, and is relatively inexpensive, where are they going to go? So on the one hand, the governor kind of blames you folks, employers, but on the other hand, the problem was really created by federal law and the Affordable Care Act. So what the governor wanted to do is kind of reestablish the old fair share contribution. He wanted it to apply to employers with 11 or more full-time equivalent employees. This should all kind of ring a bell. But the big part was he wanted to impose a penalty 
on non-compliant employers in the amount of $2,000 per full-time equivalent. Now, I can guarantee you that when this hit the street, my phone started to ring. And there were a lot of folks that were very concerned about this. And, and my advice to them was, we have a long way between January and when the budget is finalized in July. And this is essentially um, Governor uh, Baker's shot across the ball, the bow, and his attempt to basically get the attention of the employer uh, community, which he did. And, and uh, obviously, this is not what the proposal ended up being. What the governor ended up signing um, was an expansion of the EMAC. The EMAC now has become uh, a, a, uh, it's a, a two-year, two-tiered assessment. And it's, it's intended over 2018 and 2019 to collect from employers, excuse me, you folks, $400 million for the sole benefit of bailing out mass health. Okay, there's still another $200 million somewhere that they've got to deal with. Now, the expansion of the EMAC uh, goes like this. The first tier was the EMAC that we all know and don't essentially love that's been around since 2014. And basically, in tier one, the old fashioned payroll tax that's been around since 2014, is there's an increase in the payroll tax. Uh, in this EMAC rate. And so the rate, if, um, if you were paying the highest rate, which you do after six years, um, your annual contribution would ordinarily be $51 uh, per employee, every employee that was paid at least $15,000 for the year. Because of the change in the rates, in 2018, um, you will now be paying $77 per employee under the EMAC. But what the new piece was, was tier two, which is a brand new targeted assessment at specific employers. And um, um, not everyone, like tier one, applies. But the targeted assessment is on certain employers who will have to pay, in addition to tier one, 5% of wages on the first $15,000 of wages they pay to their to each employee. And so 5% of 15,000 is the maximum that you would pay in addition to the $77 under tier one, would be $750 per affected employee. Now, when this was being discussed with the governor, uh, there were certain in employer industry groups involved, including the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, um, who said to the governor in June of this year, you know, this is all sounding better than $2,000 per employee, but if we're going to bail out MassHealth, we ought to at least fix MassHealth so it doesn't happen again. And so there were a number of reforms that were agreed to by the governor and by uh, business leaders, um, but those reforms did not make it into um, the new legislation. Uh, uh, and so the governor uh, ended up signing this expansion of the EMAC without any fix to the, prob the underlying problem. Now, uh, as of last month, I'm still getting used to saying last, uh, late October, I can't believe we're already in November, um, there has been some proposed reforms in new legislation that's been, it really hasn't been introduced, but it's been produced by a, a, a Senate committee, a Massachusetts Senate committee, uh, which will now move to kind of fix parts of uh, the Mass Health program, and it goes further than that. It does other things uh, uh, in terms of uh, hospitals and hospital rates and, and other things that we don't need uh, to go into today. So this is what the government uh, governor signed. So your standard EMAC rate, as you can see, um, increases. Uh, there's the 
2017 rates and the 2018 rates in red. Again, everyone kind of talks about year six. So the most that you would pay um, in year six in 2017 at the rate of 0 0.0034 would be um, $51 for an employee. In 2018, at the increased rate, you will now pay $77 uh, per employee. And again, this is assuming the employee is has being paid at least $15,000 in, 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 in uh, wages. Employers will uh, continue to file the quarterly employment and, and wage detail report, and you pay the EMAC on a, on a quarterly um, uh, basis by the due date. And anyone who uh, doesn't pay their EMAC or only partially pays their EMAC is subject to uh, interest uh, that accrues at 12% uh, until paid. Uh, same kind of deal with uh, unemployment insurance contributions. So let's get to this targeted 5% EMAC supplement. Uh, it's now called the supplement uh, based on uh, guidance that's been provided by the Division of Unemployment Assistance, who will administer this. Uh, and so we refer to it now as the EMAC supplement. This is tier two. And the statute uh, that was passed or signed by the governor in July, this is the text from the statute. It's in quotes. I just split it up into three bullets uh, to make it a little easier to digest. So we're talking about employers that have more than five employees and they're going to pay a contribution for each employee who receives health insurance coverage through the Division of Medical Assistance, which is MassHealth, or they received subsidized insurance through the Health Connector. Okay, so for the folks who are at an income level that's too high for MassHealth, um, but still within the range to receive subsidized coverage, which is the federal premium tax credit, and also Massachusetts has a, a kicker in there as well uh, as part of premium assistance. So this isn't just about Mass Health. Uh, it's also the employer will pay a contribution for an employee that's on Mass Health or in the connector authority with individual coverage. Um, the, they're called the connector care plans, okay? And the contribution is going to be computed by multiplying wages uh, paid to, to that employee um, by 5%. Um, and again, those wages, those that contribution will be paid over quarterly, okay? All well and good, but obviously there were a lot of holes. Um, in terms of how we are going to uh, approach implementing and administering the supplement. So some FAQs were quietly released by the Division of Unemployment Assistance late last month, which merely means late last week. Okay, now the EMAC supplement, the, according to the FAQs, the EMAC supplement is based on wages paid and not hours worked. So you can see that if you're not talking about people making more than 30 hours or working more than 30 hours a week being full time or those working you know less than 30 hours a week or part time, basically they say it's just based on wages. So here's here's the first major point. You as employers will pay the EMAC supplement for all of your employees full-time or part-time if that em for each of those employees that is either in mass health or connector care now you may say well wait a minute our part-time employees are not even eligible for our health coverage so why are we paying a fee to the government to the state um, on people who aren't even eligible for our health plan the reason is, is this is a bailout program, plain and simple. And the way they are working this, uh, rather than reinstituting some kind of complicated mass fair share uh, um, program, uh, is to have a payroll tax. And so this payroll tax, 
And this part of it, the supplement part, applies to all employees, full-time or part-time. If you're paying them wages and um, they are on Mass Health or in the connector care, you're going to pay the supplement on that employee. Okay. You can see how this is going to hit some, some uh, businesses and some industries more than others. And it's the same old industries that get hit the hardest. Restaurants, retail, home health care agencies, um, and nursing homes. So again, the 5% targeted EMAC assessment is now called the EMAC supplement. Okay, it's called that in the FAQs and in the draft regs that we're going to look at in a minute. Um, now, if you have employees who are in the premium assistance program, which is a mass health program that enrolls people in your group health plan, and then mass health pays the premium to you because it's cheaper for them to pay the premium to have the individual in your health plan than to provide benefits to that individual. Those folks in the premium assistance program are not considered an employee on Mass Health for the supplement purposes. Okay, so you can cross those people off your list if you have any. Now, the DUA, now that the draft regs are out, plans listening sessions across the state, and then based on the listening sessions, they'll issue final regulations. Now, given that this is going to be implemented on January 1, um, I, I'm hoping that they're going to have those uh, listening sessions pretty quick, and hopefully none of them will um, um, take place on Thanksgiving Day. Um, so now, Monday, uh, the 6th, two days ago, uh, draft EMAC supplement regs hit the street. These regs are only for the supplement not the regular piece that you've been paying already uh, for the last four years, but it's going to be juiced. The rates are going to be juiced. That's tier one. These regs are only about this supplement where an employer might have to pay 5% up to $750. Okay. So again, this begins 1-1-2018. And so any employer who has six or more employees in the quarter is in the EMAC supplement game and may be subject to the EMAC supplement uh, for that quarter. So how do you know whether or not you have six or more? Well, the regs, the draft regs tell you that you look at the number of employees who worked or received wages during any part of a payroll period that includes the 12th of the month. So that's how you cover, you, you count your number of workers is look at the 12th of the month and look at anybody who received or worked in, uh, worked in you know, they haven't received their paycheck yet, um, but had hours worked or received wages in the payroll period uh, that included the 12th of the month. You take that 12th of the month snapshot for all three months of the quarter and divide by three. And vo voila, you know whether or not you have six or more for the quarter. If you have six or more, you may be subject to the EMAC supplement for that quarter. Okay. Now, you're only going to pay the EMAC supplement on f your employees who are enrolled in Mass Health or Connector Care. So, how do you know who's enrolled? Well, that's another question. But assuming you know who's enrolled, and we'll get to the other issue of how do you know who's enrolled. Um, do they have to be enrolled all quarter, a uh, full month, two months? How does that work? The draft EMAC regs say that anyone who is enrolled in Mass Health or Connector Care for a continuous period of 14 days in the quarter will be will be someone that um, um, that the employer will have to pay the EMAC supplement on the wages paid to that individual uh, in the quarter. Um, there is no EMAC liability for your employees who are in Mass Health who are permanently and totally disabled, okay, and so they have Mass Health 
uh, it, because they're they're also disabled and they're for social security disability income purposes. Maybe there's another reason uh, uh, under state law that they're covered by MassHealth. Or if they're also covered by you, and which makes MassHealth a secondary payer, then the fact that they're in MassHealth will not subject you to the EMAC liability because they're also um, covered by your insurance uh, program. Don't think that's highly likely, um, uh, but that's the way uh, this rolls out. Now, nonprofits and governmental employers are still liable for the EMAC supplement. Doesn't matter what method you use to finance your unemployment insurance benefits, whether you use the contributory method or the reimbursement method. Again, this is for nonprofits and governmental. Um, you're subject to the EMAC. There are some change in ownership rules uh, for people, you know, where you have uh, folks buying and selling and merging and whatever, you know, acquiring other companies and whatnot. Um, um, but basically, if what I get out of this is that if you're the buyer and you acquire another business or another uh, another entity, uh, um, and let's say it happens in the middle of the quarter, and you have some folks who um, uh, that that come along as part of the acquisition, and the seller has been paying the EMAC supplement on those folks. Um, you as the buyer don't get any any credit for any EMAC supplement payment amounts that were made by the seller, the acquired employer. Okay. Um, so if they if the employer paid the the the, the seller paid for several you know one or two months of EMAC and then you uh, buy the company or by the assets and the employees come along, uh, you're going to pay the EMAC. Uh, but as, as to getting to the $750 cap, you can't use what the seller paid before the acquisition date. Okay, that's the best way I can describe it. The EMAC supplement payments are due quarterly. They're due on the last day of the month following the end of the quarter. Okay. Interest is assessed on late EMAC payments. Uh, just like unemployment insurance and whatnot, the DUA can collect overdue amounts. They can uh, impose property liens. They can levy your bank account, which means they go right in there and take the money out. Uh, we even saw a lot of that with uh, under the old mass health reform with mass fair share contribution. Okay. Um, and there are penalties for failure to comply with the EMAC rules as well. Um, if you are assessed an EMAC supplement, you may uh, appeal that by requesting a hearing. It's a very short time frame. Once the DUA tells you that they've determined that you have an EMAC supplement, and maybe you agree that you owe an EMAC supplement for the quarter, but you don't agree in the amount or which employees it applies to, you have to file your appeal Within 10 days of the DUA determination, uh, the, uh, there will be uh, a hearing following the normal DUA protocols that they use for unemployment insurance and they use for mass fair share contribution back in the day. Uh, and they'll issue a written decision on their initial determination, whether it's approved, you know, denied, modified. Um, if you're still not happy, you can go to court and file suit against the DUA in Superior Court. Now, there are confidentiality rules that apply between the state agencies, basically uh, the Division of Medical Assistance, the Health Connector, and DUA. There's also confidentiality rules for employers, for you folks. It does say that the DUA can provide member inf info to you as an employer for your review. Um, uh, or to use in, in an appeal, okay, uh, due to the DUA's EMAC determination. The information has to be confidential. The, you have to use limited use, limited necessary, which is kind of the similar to the to the HIPAA standard, right? The privacy standard. Uh, 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 only people with need to know, minimum necessary uh, uh, use and disclosure. 
uh, the employer, you folks, will sign a written acknowledgement of your confidentiality obligations uh, and your understanding of any other DUA procedures that, that they're going to establish. Okay, and you cannot retaliate or disparage an employee um, because you found out that they're on Mass Health or Connector Care. And uh, I, we're probably thinking about employees that are already on our staff. But what about an employee who applies for coverage, or I'm sorry, applies for employment, and for some one reason or another, you as an employer learn that they're on Mass Health or they have connector care coverage, uh, and you decide not to hire them um, because you don't want to deal with the with the EMAC supplement. Uh, you'd rather hire someone who uh, you wouldn't have to pay the EMAC supplement on. That may be considered retaliation. Not quite sure, um, um, but we'll we'll keep an eye on that, and we may get more information about that in the listening sessions. So you should also know that there's this draft Massachusetts legislation. It was released two weeks ago by a special Senate committee on health reform, um, and. Again, it's just draft legislation, but the provisions say that MassHealth, the, the Division of Medical Assistance, DMA, can request uh, employers to provide um, information, health insurance information, about their employees who have applied for MassHealth or the connector care. Uh, and I think as part of that, the legislation, the draft legislation, requires the Division of Medical Assistance to create a herd form, which as we all know and love is the Health Insurance Res uh, Responsibility Disclosure form, but it's not gonna look like the old form from, from days of old. These are the types of things that the employer will need to report annually under oath to the Division of Medical Assistance. I believe it's not quite clear whether this would be provided once to the Division of Medical Assistance, one form, or whether a form would have to be filled out for every employee of yours that is on subsidized coverage. Um, again, if you receive any information um, from DUA, um, you, you can only use it as authorized uh, and treat it confidential. Uh, confidentially. Um, so that's the part of this that deals with the EMAC. But you know, as I said, the ACA does not leave one of the burners. It may not be on the front burner, uh, but it's still there. As you may know, the IRS has released 27, the final 27 forms um, for the 1094 and 1095 Cs and the final instructions. And as of right now, you folks will be required to file once again. The IRS made it very clear in June of this year through some informational letters where they clarified that the individual mandate and the employer mandate are the law of the land. They remain in force unless there's congressional action. All right. So if you've been carrying your rabbit's foot and you've been really hoping uh, and praying that um, the 1094, 1095 filing requirements were going to go away. Um, not going to happen. All right. And again, don't forget, I just indi I just told you earlier that the IRS has actually uh, buffed up their their rules related to um, collecting assessments under the the federal I I employer mandate, the employer shared responsibility uh, uh, assessment. So you're going to be in the game for this again this year if you have 50 or more last year. Um, the IRS has released a bunch of new rates. Uh, notice that the affordability rates that you use when you compute affordability using one of your safe harbors, be it W-2 or um, uh, uh, rate of pay or federal poverty line, um, has actually decreased for 2018. Uh, and this is actually the first time that, that the indexed rate has decreased since it began. 
Now, if you're one of those employers that set the contribution for your lowest paid employees to the 9.69% rate, you're going to have to increase your contribution in 2018 in order to lower the employee's contribution to meet the 9.56% uh, and to remain affordable. The PCORI fee, uh, we're getting close to the end of this, the PCORI fee, which runs through, uh, through the end of 2019, has gone up another 13 cents. It will be $2.39 for plan years ending on or after uh, 10-1-17. Uh, for employee contributions to flexible spending accounts, um, uh, for, uh, health FSAs, for next year, for tax years beginning in 2018, it goes up 50 bucks. Uh, so you can, if you wish, your employees can contribute up to $2,650 in 2018 for their medical FSA. The IRS has also indicated that it will not accept any silent returns. What's a silent return? That's a return where the, um, where the individual taxpayer filling out their 1040 does not indicate on the form whether or not they had health insurance. Um, for the whole year uh, and, and is subject to the individual mandate penalties. So if you're filing, you, you know, using uh, uh, some uh, TurboTax or something else electronic and you send it into the IRS and you don't answer those questions, it's going to bounce right back and it will not be accepted. If you're filing in paper, um, they'll create other issues there. So the 1040, uh, must indicate that the taxpayer had coverage or there was an exemption that applied so they didn't have to have coverage um, or they're going to indicate right there on the form that they're going to pay their shared responsibility payment. Either they're cutting a check or if they have a refund, it's going to come out of the refund. So you can see there that um, we're tightening up a bit. You've probably heard about the executive order that President Trump signed in the middle of October, where they were really focusing on three areas to, uh, for regulatory improvement in the near term to increase uh, tracing competition. Uh, don't know that a lot can be done there, um, but we'll keep an eye on that. As you know, or may have heard as well, that the Affordable Care Act cost sharing reduction payments to health insurers who insure individuals in the exchanges and charge less, less for co-pays and co-insurance and deductibles because of their income. Um, and they get reimbursed by, by the feds, will stop, has stopped. And the truth is, is that those payments to the insurers under uh, is, is uh, does not, is illegal under the Affordable Care Act, believe it or not, uh, uh, and is illegal under the Constitution uh, because any, any funding of that nature must be approved by Congress. Congress did not approve this. Uh, at the time, President Obama asked Congress to approve this. Congress did not approve it uh, to release these funds and um, President Obama went ahead and uh, issued a, a, a directive to the Treasury Department um, on his own to release the funds. So it's been in and out of court. Um, and as of right now, the cost sharing reduction payments have ceased. Um, they, we're also seeing some bipartisan bills pop up. The first one, again, in, in um, October was the Murray Alexander Bipartisan Healthcare Stabilization Act, uh, which is really meant to prop up the exchanges by authorizing these cost sharing subsidies and whatnot um, uh, for, in this case, two years to give the states more flexibility to vary their uh, health insurance plans in their exchanges. Um, and the Congressional Budget Office, looking at this over a 10-year period in the future, indicated that there'd be a slight reduction in the deficit and no net uh, enrollment change, plus or minus. Um, 
there's also another bipartisan uh, effort uh, by a, a chairpersons of a, a of a House and a in a Senate uh, committee to do some minor structural health reform uh, with a temporary two-year funding again for these cost-sharing reductions. Um, it would extend the cost-sharing reductions for two years through 2019. It would suspend the individual mandate for four years. And it would exempt employers from the employer mandate penalties um, right up through the end of this year, okay? Um, so for filing years 2015, 2016, and 2017, there would be no mandate penalties. And they're also tinkering with the uh, health savings accounts. Um, interestingly enough, well, let me go back here for a minute. Um, in a recent, uh, recently, uh, uh, Paul Ryan uh, uh, in the House indicated that there would be no further action on the Affordable Care Act, either through repeal, replace, or any of this bipartisan stuff. So this would be seem to be dead in the water. Then two, three days ago, you may have heard there was some um, organization who uh, is reporting that now some senators and uh, lawmakers are saying, well, maybe we can throw in some stabilization with the the uh, federal tax reform bill that's now being uh, uh, shepherded through uh, shepherded through Congress. So it never seems to end. Um, just quickly, as you might also know, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders proposed a Medicare for All program. Uh, obviously, there's no chance of this passing while uh, Republicans uh, control the House and the Senate and the presidency. But I don't think the purpose is, is to get this passed right now, but I think it is food for thought to get it out there to make it part of the conversation. I also think that you will see this as being part of the platform of those individuals who are running in the midterms next year in 2018 and are running for president in 2020. There are a number, I don't know, 15 or 16 um, um, uh, senators who have uh, signed on to this bill uh, in support, including uh, Massachusetts' own um, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, okay? Uh, but as proposed, it would be transitioned over a four-year period where folks would get to, uh, get to have Medicare. Cost is a big issue, okay? There's really no cost with this. It hasn't been scored by the CBO. When Senator Sanders was on the campaign trail uh, in 2016, um, uh, he indicated that he had an estimated annual cost of 1.4 trillion a year. Uh, um, you know, who knows uh, at this point? Um, and it would be paid for by what else? Taxes on. Uh, all Americans on employers and on additional taxes on the quote unquote wealthy. So that's out there, just wanna let you know it's there. Um, all right, so let's go back to Massachusetts very quick. I only have two more slides. And it's, I'm gonna talk about paid family leave, medical leave, um, whether or not that's on the horizon. There are, there is our, paid medical leave bills, both a Senate version and a House version, here in Massachusetts that were introduced uh, in January and have been parked in legislative committees since. Uh, don't know if they have any legs, don't know where they're going. However, certain groups collected enough ballots and in September, um, the Mass Attorney General certified proposed uh, paid medical leave as a ballot initiative for November of 2018. If you recall, this is how we got the Massachusetts earned sick time law. Okay, that was a ballot initiative that was voted on by voters um, and it, 
if the uh, Massachusetts lawmakers don't do anything uh, with the bills that are currently sitting in committee, uh, next November, uh, folks in Massachusetts will be able to vote on the proposed paid family medical leave law. And the items are here. Up to 16 weeks of family leave, 26 weeks of medical leave, for all the usual reasons, for the care of a new child, birth, adoption, etc. Address your serious health condition or to care for a seriously ill family member uh, or dealing with family member needs as a resulting from active duty military. Get this, the paid family medical leave benefit would be 90% of average weekly earnings up to $1,000 per week. Kind of a rich benefit. Um, employer contribution will be 0 0.0063 of each employee's annual wage. Um, just guessing that would probably be um, um, that would probably be about $65 a, a year per employee. Um, or actually, that's of annual wage. That's not limited to the first 15,000. So I take that, like the EMAX, so I take that back. The contributions will be placed in a separate trust managed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There will be a job pay benefit protection when you return. Um, the Associated Industries of Massachusetts estimates that the per employee cost um, to employers annually would be about $520. I haven't seen their estimate or how they uh, calculated that, uh, but you ought to at least know that this is on the uh, um, on the radar uh, and uh, could impact you as employers uh, next year. The other one is is a minimum wage proposal. This one has also been certified by the Mass AG uh, for ballot vote in 2018 as well, and this would boost as proposed would boost the minimum wage from 11 to 15 dollars uh, by 2022 and uh, again you know it's going to be up to the voters uh, and if voted on it will have to be enacted by by the state legislature um, so that might be something else you want to keep an eye on uh, on the horizon so um, as I usually say in any of my presentations, this will not be the last webinar, seminar, presentation that you will attend with regard um, to health reform, be it Massachusetts health reform, federal health reform, um, or just ERISA compliance in general. Uh, as you can see, there's still a lot going on, uh, and uh, uh, we still have final regs to come out on the EMAC. Uh, those won't come out until the listening sessions are done, and I can only hope that those will be done uh, uh, quickly and efficiently uh, so that the final regs can uh, be available to employers so that you can plan. I will tell you, and this is just based on my own personal uh, uh, view and opinion, that the draft regulations are pretty basic. Uh, there, there's nothing... Uh, uh, jaw dropping in there. There's there's nothing that uh, is really pushing the limits. Uh, so I imagine that most, if not all, of that would would stay. Uh, in terms of what might happen in the final regs, depending on the listening sessions, is you may find that uh, the additional regs uh, would deal with other open issues, not necessarily change what's currently in the draft and print. Particularly, I still think one of the, the biggest open questions is how as you, as an employer, going to know which of your employees um, are on mass health or connector care? Now, you might have an enrollment form and they may waive your coverage and you might have a checkbox that says, are you on mass health or the connector care? And they might be able to check that box, et cetera. But what about all the employees that you have that aren't eligible for medical and they don't have a waiver form because they're not, there's nothing for them to waive because they're not eligible for your employer-sponsored coverage. 
um, so th that'll be an issue. Clearly, there are some inferences there that there'll be some information sharing with the employer by DUA and possibly uh, the Mass Division uh, 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 of Health. But it's not clear whether that would happen after the end of the quarter, whether you as employers are still required to uh, do your own EMAC supplement calculation, make the payment, if any, by the end of the month following the quarter end. And then, you know, the DUA may come back and based on their information, say, no, you said you had five employees who you're paying a, uh, an EMAC supplement on. It really ought to be eight employees. Uh, at, at that point, obviously, they would need to share wh where the differences are, okay? But, but it's not, uh, it, the way the reg is written now, it does not appear that employers would wait for the DUA to do its calculation and let you know what to pay. Uh, it just, it just, in my view, it just doesn't read that way. Um, so we need to see. And so I think we'll have additional detail that might be helpful. But in terms of, again, what's in the draft uh, regs now, I don't see much of that changing. We're almost uh, out of time within just a few minutes. And so at this point, um, I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, I don't know if Karen's available to jump in. I hear her there. And yes, um, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, one that came in was, does this include partner employees receiving guaranteed payments? I think it may boil down to <clears throat> the AMAC being only on actual employees. Is yeah, I, yeah. The, the shorthand there is, um, is the employer paying um, unemployment insurance on that individual? Okay, if that individual, uh, uh, and if that's the case, um, then then the EMAC would apply. Uh, obviously, I would imagine that someone who's you know who's an owner uh, of that type of entity is not going to be in danger of being on Mass Health or the Connector Care. So. Uh, um, I don't think the supplement will be a problem. If they're asking about the underlying tier one EMAC, um, that's an issue that they should know about now because the EMAC's been around since 2014. And so I go back to my, my kind of shorthand is, is UI, unemployment insurance, uh, uh, contributions being made uh, quarterly for that individual. Uh, if so, they're probably meeting the definition uh, uh, of an employee for purposes of unemployment insurance. And much of, of the EMAC, because it's, it is um, done quarterly just like unemployment insurance, it's administered by the DUA just like unemployment uh, insurance, they share a lot of the same uh, definitions. So I can't answer that question definitively without um, spending some time uh, in the weeds trying to, to uh, figure that out. It is not in uh, any of the information that's been released thus far. But again, a lot of what's been released has uh, dozens of cross-references to uh, the unemployment insurance statute. And, and so that's why I say the, the quickest way to get to that would would be to to look at whether unemployment insurance applies to that individual. Okay, and we have a couple more questions. I don't know if we'll be able to answer them, but one of them was whether or not uh, out-of-state employees, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> would be included when you're trying to determine if you're six plus employees for the DUA and EMAC supplement. Um, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, and again, I know that that's one of the things that we were hoping that they would um, address in the draft regs. And I think, again, what will happen is uh, through the listening sessions, and there'll be some written commentary 
uh, I've submitted, I'm sure, as well. Uh, you can see that these are the type of things or, or, or issues that will be added to the regs, but not necessarily change what's already there in draft form. Uh, those types of clarifications would be would be extremely important. Um, and and I, I know that there was hope that um, you know that that would be answered, but it, it was not addressed in these draft regs. And I think one last quick question, hopefully. Um, how do we know if, if a nonprofit organization has been exempted because they're a religious organization, um, will they now be required to do an unemployment contribution subject to the EMAC? Um, you mean a, contribu a, employ a contribution based on the EMAC? Yeah. Very, uh, very interesting question. Great question. Because uh, religious organizations uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, who have um, uh, church plans and, and, and whatnot, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, um, are exempted. And uh, I don't believe uh, that they're paying the EMAC now. Um, and so... Um, I, I think that, um, um, again, I don't want to call it a loophole. They had the same issue with mass fair share contribution, where the religious organization said, "Hey, we're, you know, we're fancy free here. You know, we don't, we don't fall." Again, there was a lot of cross references to the unemployment insurance law, and the religious organizations were like, "Bonus, you know, we're we're good." And then they they changed the they changed the law. Uh, to make them subject to the Bass Fair Share contribution. Right now, I see the same thing playing out. The, the EMAC does not appear to apply because of the ex explicit exemption uh, for religious organizations. Will they patch it uh, when they figure it out? Uh, I'm not going to tell them. Um, but <laughs> but um, uh, if they figure it out on their own, or someone from a religious organization asks them, um, they may get an answer they um, do not like. Okay. Uh, the other thing I, I forgot to mention, I'll do it very quickly, um, is under the standard EMAC, where you just have the rates um, uh, in the tier one, it appears that obviously if you just hit six and you're newly subject to the EMAC, um, you don't pay any EMAC uh, for the first three years. I don't believe the supplement is going to run the same way. It, 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 at least based on my reading of the regulation and, and what we have, there's nothing that suggests that the supplement would be the, the six plus would be done the same way. Uh, obviously, the reg tells you, and I have it in the slide, how to determine if you have six or more for the quarter. But there's nothing in there that has a phased in approach uh, like there is explicitly for the tier one. And I have to believe that that was done intentionally uh, because there's already, you know, uh, EMAC rules for the for the tier one that's been around since 2014. They have this phased in approach for that, uh, but it was not uh, the phased in approach for the $750. There's no phased in approach. So I would say if you've been a small employer and you suddenly hit six or more in a quarter, I, I'm I'm almost tempted to say. You wouldn't pay the tier one because the tier one has a has a three year um, um, exemption for people who just first become subject to the EMAC, but the EMAC supplement is different, and I think that's something else that that needs to be clarified. Um, although I don't know, I want to be the one to ask that because if we get an answer we don't like, then everyone will blame me. Um, <clears throat> Well, I but think, but I, I just want to put it is, I'm sorry, Rick. I think our nope. time is up. Um, 
I want to thank you so much for your presentation and all the information and thank all the attendees that joined us today. We're going to look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You're welcome.